Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I want to start a very exciting vlog and that is for the Dandelion Dynasty series. Now I am afraid this vlog will be very long because we have four massive books to read but I'm so excited because first of all these books are stunningly gorgeous. I absolutely love this design of the covers and all of them put together are so pretty but then also I've heard nothing but good things from a lot of my bookish friends about the series so I hope this will be a new favorite. I have very strong like five star feelings towards the series and so I can't wait to talk to you about it. Now the way this video works is that I will share with you my thoughts whenever I reach the halfway point of a book and when I finish a book so yeah this will probably take a while until I talk to you again <laughs> and um, yeah I have 300 pages to go from where I am right now. I have not really any idea what this series is actually about apart from that it is a high fantasy that is inspired by I think the history of China and we have this first book which I think I've heard is a little bit more like the Silmarillion in the sense that it spans a larger amount of time and quite a large cast of characters to kind of set up this world and then I think from the second book onwards that is handled a little bit differently so we'll see <laughs> how I like it. Um, I will definitely talk more about what this is about or what the themes are and stuff like that when I get through the series but right now I just wanted to welcome you on this little journey. So I'm halfway through Grace of Kings and this is amazing guys, this is so good, I love it. <laughs> so far this is straight up five stars for me, I am obsessed, I'm flying through this book which is great because I need it for the magical readathon but yeah I'm a little bit more than halfway through right now and so much has happened, I don't even know where to start to talk about this series but maybe a good uh, place to start would be what this is actually about. So in this book we are following a kind of like a cluster of islands and on these islands we have like seven kingdoms but in the past one kingdom uh, kind of conquered all of the other ones and now there is an emperor and uh, all of the other kings were killed and a lot of their like families were killed and stuff like that. But at the beginning of the book things are starting to look worse and worse for the emperor so we kind of watch this empire go down and the descendants of the kings taking back power but also like a lot of other players popping up. So the best way I can describe this and I know this is dangerous but to me this book is what I wanted Game of Thrones to be <laughs> because I really did not like um, the Game of Thrones series that much but I think this one is that just so much better. We have a lot of players, a lot of characters, very high fantasy. We have very little magic. There are a couple of things and we also have gods that we see sporadically <laughs> just um, discussing what's going on or maybe guiding some of our characters. So this is definitely very reminiscent of that, but it is inspired by Chinese history. We are mainly following two characters in this book, but you know, there is tons of others, but those two are kind of like the main ones. We have uh, Kuni, who is kind of like a do no good kind of person. Um, he comes from a kind of good family, but he never really had any ambition to do anything great. He likes spending his time in taverns and just having fun, drinking, gambling, stuff like that. But because of like things that happen and a very special lady that he meets, he decides to kind of make something of his life and so he gets sucked into all of this. And then we have another character, Mata, and he is the descendant of one of the kings, or no, one of the dukes, I think, yeah. And um, his family was very, very famous for um, their fighting skills. So they um, were great warriors, but also great uh, tacticians and, yeah, all of his family was killed except for his cowardly uncle. 
And this uncle then brought Marta up and he taught him the position of his family and all of the things that he remembered about strategy, about fighting, about being a warrior. So Marta becomes this like very great warrior, like almost like out of fairy tales kind of warrior. And he has like very strong beliefs about how the world should be and what his place should be and stuff like that. And so these are the two characters that um, yeah, kind of are the catalysts of the story. But as I said, there is so much more going on and it's so fantastic the way everything is woven together, the setbacks, the victories, the way that some of these characters are so deliciously despicable that you want to hate them, but in others, even though they might be on the villains kind of side, you still kind of feel for them and you see that they're just trying to do a good job. <laughs> with like the little bit that they've been hand handed and so yeah I love this it's so great the characters feel so real like where you know with Game of Thrones I'm sorry I make this comparison I always felt like these characters aren't really like real people I never really understood what they were doing <laughs> And it's completely different with this book. These characters feel 100% real. And because we usually get like a lot of their like inner thoughts and their motivations and their backstories, it's so easy to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that just makes it so special. And this is obviously a lot of pages and it is the, tiny, the, the smallest book in this series. So I can only imagine <laughs> where we go from here. But I think it really, really helps to have so much information on all of these characters, no matter whether they're super important for the story or whether they disappear within like two chapters for some reason. But we really understand what's going on here. And there are a couple of things that I also enjoy about this. For one thing, we do get the like um, very sexist kind of battle bashing language and that is challenged by one of the characters which I loved so um, that was really great to have a man being like hey look these women are doing great jobs for us they're being so brave they're being so strong so why would it be an insult to be called a woman and I love that and then it's very rare glimpses, but we see that queer people are accepted, at least queer men are accepted in this world as well. So we have one character where it is alluded to that he fancies a, another soldier, and that is very much like supported by his uh, friends. And I really liked seeing that. And then we also have a hero figure where it is mentioned that um, he was interested in men and women alike. So uh, by a uh, person, I would say. So um, yeah, and that is like a great hero and it's not seen as a flaw or anything like that. So so far that has only been like men uh, so I would love to see that we also see like some queer women in here but so far that hasn't happened I think but still it is very great to see that this is not something that is challenged or discussed or like seen as a flaw or something to be fixed or anything like that so I really appreciated that. I don't think I will say much more for now because there's way too much to say, I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, this book is definitely <laughs> very emotional, like there's funny moments, there's very tragic moments, there's moments when characters die that you really really love, but there's also like very compassionate moments where these characters just get so much closer to each other, they communicate, they see each other, they hear each other, and it's lovely. So there is a lot, a lot going on. The first time one of the characters dies that I liked um, is when the bandits get um, counterattacked, basically, and the kind of pious bandit is like, yeah, we need you, you have to leave, I will fight them so you can escape. That just, it was so heartbreaking. Um, that was like the first moment where a character died that I really liked, and so from that, <laughs> 
we just go onwards and more people die. Some we're kind of happy about, some we're really sad about. So um, yeah, it's great. It's great. If you like these kind of high fantasies, read this book. Just do it. So I have finished Grace of Kings and wow, <laughs> what a book, what a book. I decided to give this book five stars. I think it's amazing. I think it is what uh, fantasy should be. I'm so impressed by this first book and I don't even know how the next book is gonna be even better but that's what I heard so I trust y'all that you're not lying to me but yeah this this was just great. I think um, some of these character arcs that we get in here are so intriguing and at times very painful to read about because not everything is going as we would have liked I guess in the second half but it's just so complex and yeah it just explores this idea of who is a good ruler and what is a good like kind of philosophy of ruling and stuff like that so I really really enjoyed it I would highly recommend <laughs> and I don't know I, I I just really am so intrigued to read more of this series now uh, something that uh, bugged me a little bit in the middle of the book is that there is quite a stretch in this that gets very very male so we uh, only have like the male characters really playing a part but towards the end that definitely changes again we do have quite a few very interesting female characters in here starting with the goddesses but also on the more human level um, so I I really like that that wasn't like an overall thing in this book but just yeah there was just a little bit in the middle where I was like where are all the women right now <laughs> like what are they doing but I think that um, because this is inspired by I think real Chinese history and so we have a very patriarchal society and a very strong a belief system that is sexist I think that this is portrayed really really well and it is not done in a way that doesn't question things uh, it does actually question quite a lot of that so I just really enjoyed how it was handled in this book overall and I think that the female characters that we get in here are all very very different um, very smart characters very strong characters and so yeah I don't really mind it overall just keep in mind that there might be some parts of this book where like well it's all like very much testosterone right now <laughs> um, but yeah I really enjoyed this would highly recommend I think I'm gonna go into a couple of spoilers just in case you've read the book and you want to discuss a little bit um, not gonna do it too much because I don't want the video to be hours long but yeah if you haven't read this skip ahead and then you can hear my thoughts on the second book wow Marta what was going on there <laughs> I think that um, the way his character shifted was so unexpected to me but it definitely made sense. It was still like very very sad to see the way that he just felt betrayed so quickly and he had this like guy who was kind of um, yeah trying to help him I guess but he was yeah not giving him great advice an advisor that's that's what i'm trying to say but this advice definitely wasn't good and i i just yeah it was just painful uh to just see him get so isolated and not realizing his mistake that this is something he could so easily kind of dissolve uh, by just reaching out again um and so yeah it was just heartbreaking to kind of watch that and to know that he really doesn't know better because no one ever taught him to connect to people and this like moment when he starts thinking that he is like almost a god is the moment where you know he can just never come back and 
uh, just be with other people again because he starts seeing himself as completely separate. So it definitely has this like narcissistic narcissistic I don't know <laughs> tendency um, which I think is very fitting for his character but yeah it was just so sad because I just loved seeing him and Cooney getting along and just having this like very improbable but lovely friendship in the first part of the book and so that was completely shattered I also thought it was interesting the way that we can see the gods actually interfering a little bit more in the second half. So we have, um, don't, don't punish me with the names, I'm so sorry, but we have this like, this one god who always uh, appears with the white cape and he's trying to push this uh, woman that lives with Mata at the end to betray him as well and I thought her character arc was quite interesting and that's one of the things I wish would have been explored a little bit more because I could not really follow what she was thinking all the time, especially towards the end. But yeah, it was just interesting to see um, just how they had their favorites and as well like the ending with the gods was like very interesting as well. I think the ending with Mata wasn't exactly my favorite. Um, I don't know, <laughs> I guess up until the end I wished for something else, but I knew that there wasn't going to be a lot else for him but yeah I, I still I don't know I, I don't know how I feel about that but yeah it was kind of sad to have also the brothers um, who get kind of divided because one follows Kuni and one follows Mata and to uh, yeah to just have that just added an additional layer because we see them as such young kids basically taking care of each other and then just choosing different sides and it's just heartbreaking but I guess that is what war is so yeah I I just really love that <laughs> now I've heard a couple of comments <laughs> about uh, some of the characters where I'm very intrigued to see where it goes like especially the whole situation with the two wives now in this book I really loved it because we do see that um at first at least um both wives are quite okay with that but it seems that now we have this conflict because Cooney wants to make his youngest son his heir and obviously his first wife is not really feeling that so there will probably be intrigue and maybe even more we'll see. I loved this book so much it was so good and it was so complex and so great and I just oh, I can't wait to read more so yeah I, I also really love these characters so I decided to take a bit of a break now just so they can just be <laughs> and I just didn't want to continue on with their struggles in the next book because I'm pretty sure um, that we'll have a bit of a time jump probably um, and that things will get out of hand a little bit we'll see but that's my thoughts on the first book really loved it and i'll talk to you when i'm halfway through the second one so i am halfway through wall of storms right now and i have mixed feelings and we need to talk about this <laughs> So, uh, a lot of people have said that this is even better than the first book. So I was really, really excited to go into the second book. I was expecting so much and the beginning was amazing. I loved the start of this. We get introduced to a completely new character that we hadn't met before and we get their whole backstory and um, just the current developments and how it all fits into the characters we already know and I loved it. It was so great. And that took up a lot of the beginning, like over a hundred pages. But then we go into 
I would call that like a second era kind of thing, like um, where the themes of this book change quite a lot. And in that part, we see a character that we already know from the first book and that I was actually kind of warned about by some fellow readers that this would turn out to be quite a frustrating character. But I really liked them in the first book, so I was like, yeah, we'll see about that. But this character in the second book has changed so much to the point where I don't even really recognize them. And so with the second era of this book, we kind of get into a very frustrating bit that I just felt very triggered by on a personal level because of experiences that I've had with characters or with people who have a similar character to this fictional one. And I just can't handle it, to be honest. And now I am into kind of a third era where we get kind of a completely new threat to everything. And this has just started, but it already is kind of a trope that I don't really like. And that is like the overpowering villain kind of trope, like where the villain is just so mighty or has such a strong weapon that they can't be defeated. So I hope I hope that this won't be like that for very long, but just the start of this new threat does make it out to be that way. So we'll see about that. So what can I say overall without spoilers? I don't like this book as much as the first one, unfortunately, even though I loved the beginning and I would have loved a book that is just 850 pages of that, just the minutiae of this like uh, empire and how it's thriving and all of these new laws and rules, like I could have done that, I wouldn't mind that. But um, I think why I don't enjoy this as much is because we have a very different perspective from the first book. Now in the first book we follow a empire that is crumbling and that is not very good. <laughs> it's not very efficient or effective and so seeing it kind of dying is good in a sense because you know that only when this disappears something better can emerge. Now, in the second book, we have a very different perspective because we have an empire that actually works really, really well. And so now we need kind of threats, inner threats and outer threats to threaten everything just to make it interesting, I guess, and to make this a story worth telling. And for our characters to only have so few years of like freedom and peace, it just breaks my heart and I just don't like it. <laughs> I think that people who enjoy Game of Thrones because there is never really any relief and whenever someone thinks they're at the top, they're brought down immediately. I think if you like those kind of stories, you will probably really love this. But I just want to see these characters thriving and so seeing it all crumble again, even though it was going so well, it just breaks my heart, it gives me anxiety, and I'm just struggling overall. <laughs> so that's all I'm gonna say um, without going into any spoilers, but I do want to talk about a couple of spoilers. If you have not read this book, I would recommend jumping over the next part to my final verdict on the second book. So we have Gia, and I was warned about her, but... <sighs> She's giving such mean stepmom vibes right now and I don't understand. I really loved her character in the first book. I thought she was so clever and smart and and talented and I really adored her. And now in the second book, I don't know what she's doing. I really don't know what the fuck she's doing. Like I think she she is very set in her like thinking what would be good for this empire and for this country. And she does not accept that maybe her way is not the only way that this could go. And so she starts manipulating in the shadows to basically make it the way she wants it to be, but at the same time destroying all the peace that Kuni built. And as I said, it just breaks my heart. It makes me so frustrated and angry. And 
I don't know, like these characters still talk about that they love each other, but you can't see that or you can't see that. <laughs> like, I wouldn't say you, you uh, see that they don't love each other, but you don't see that they love each other still. They're not really talking to each other. When they talk, usually Risana's there as well. And she always feels like kind of in the middle and trying to just not drown in all of this. So yeah, I don't know. It just feels so frustrating. And I think the way that Timu is portrayed and the way that he just does not click with his father is very interesting. I'm very intrigued to see whether he will die soon because I have a very strong feeling he might. Um, but I don't understand why this super clever and smart woman from the first book is not able to see that just changing the whole empire to fit her son so he can become emperor in the future, that doesn't work. You can't change a whole country to make it fit for this leader. The leader has to fit the country. And that's what Kuni did and she destroyed it. And what especially frustrates me about this <laughs> is that she turns all of the characters that we love against Kumi and she makes them enemies. And it's just heartbreaking and it's frustrating and I get very, very angry. <laughs> so that's that. Um, I did love Zomi, but seeing her in this position where she was brought by Jia at the end, that's basically like the last thing we hear about her for a while, is also just miserable and it's manipulative and I just feel I feel so sad for her because her character also had so much potential but Gia just manages to crush and burn everything and I hate it I'm sorry but I hate it and then at this last bit right now um, where I stopped so almost at the middle we get the northern like strangers, the invaders, whatever they're gonna do, and we get the dragons. I'm gonna call them dragons, they have not been called dragons yet, but you know, they have wings, they spew fire, they're dragons. Um, and I don't know how I feel about it, <laughs> because what I liked about the first book is that we don't really have any magic, and it just feels very real. It's like very politically driven, a lot of like war, but like the horrible sides of war and stuff like that. And so I don't know how I feel about dragons. And as I said, it just tips the kind of like power scale so much right now that I'm not feeling that confident that I will like it. But we'll see. They've only just arrived and destroyed the first kind of welcome wagon, I guess. <laughs> um, I have no idea if that is an actual term or whether that is Sims language. But, oh well, now I said it. Uh, but yeah, we'll see about that. But so far I'm like really, really sad because I wanted to love this just as much as the first book. But just for my personal things that I like in books... This is not doing it so far, unfortunately. So I have been flying through this. I've read this like very, very fast. So I was very hopeful that the second half would go by very quickly as well. But since now I'm starting to not enjoy it and to get so angry and frustrated, I have to take breaks while reading just to breathe through it. <laughs> So maybe I will slow down now and that would be sad because I really liked that I was flying through this and um, even though this is a very big book, I thought I could get it done in under two weeks, which would be very cool. And now I'm also a bit worried because I have two more very big books in this series. One thing, one last thing I want to say, I want to say is that I love Thera and I want her to be the Empress. So yesterday I finished reading A Wall of Storms, so I'm here for the update. And this is a very, very difficult book to talk about because I have so many kind of mixed feelings 
when I think about this because some parts of this made me so angry, some parts made me anxious <laughs> so that I just flew through this book just to get it over with <laughs> and some parts were really great and I really loved them and some of the new characters that we get in here I really really loved so it is conflicting feelings, but I think what I can say is that Ken Liu is an amazing writer and he's definitely, he knows what he's doing. And I think that this could have been edited a little bit more. I don't think that this needed to be longer than the first book. There were definitely two parts that I would have liked to be a bit shorter. One in the first half of the book that I already talked about and also one in the second half where we get a very, very, very long backstory on people that we ultimately don't really care about, I would say, that... Um, kind of become the enemy and I think that could have been shorter or just intermingled more with the other storylines. So I think this didn't need to be 850 pages, I think this could have been told in 650 as well, but overall I still really can see the art in this book. So I decided to give it 4.5 stars with all of my mixed feelings. Just not as good for me personally as the first book, but I think if you like uh, uh, the, Song and Ice, uh, of the Song of Ice and Fire uh, books, then you will probably really enjoy this series as well. So uh, I think that's all I can say for the non spoilery part. So I still definitely enjoyed this, but not as much as the first one. And I read this so fast. <laughs> Like, it took me eight days to read this, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, I will go into a couple of spoilers now. You can uh, jump over this part via the chapters, so you don't get spoiled if you haven't read the book already. But in this second part, we get introduced to the Lyuku. I'm sorry if I say anything wrong. There is a pronunciation guide in the beginning of the book, but it's not complete. Like, there's only like a couple of remarks. <laughs> But like with a lot of things, I have no idea how to say them. So I'm sorry if I mis mispronounce things. Um, but this is a people that come from kind of a different island or maybe even a continent um, that is very much steppe. So um, we have um, plains, um, very low vegetation and a lot of wind and just not very kind uh, kind of weather conditions and soil conditions. So this is a people that um, are nomads, they hunt, they have cattle and they have these kind of like dragon-like creatures. They're called Gerina fins and I don't know. <laughs> They're, they sound really interesting because they're basically herbivores but they can spew fire because of the way they, I don't know the English terms, of the way they, their stomachs do stuff to the food, like there's gases and they can use these gases to spew fire. But basically they're like very, very, very large deer with wings, but I also think they only have two legs, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, yeah, not a lot of like very visual things happening in my head from this description, but in my head they're basically dragons that look like deer. And these become our enemies because they find a way to come to Dara. And I just, oh, the backstory of this was way too long. Like all of the history of this like leading guy dude of this people I did not need. Like he is just an evil dude and that's all I needed to know. I did not need to know everything he's ever done in his life. And you can definitely see that he is a very interesting counterpiece to Cooney because they're both very cunning but their goals are completely different while Cooney is trying to build a just society that is great for everyone all that the other dude, and I will not try to pronounce the name, uh, is going for is just get power. And he kind of also wants good for his people, 
but in such a weird way that I don't buy it. Like, he doesn't really care. Like, I don't know. Like, um, in the first book, I cared about all of the sides because I felt like everyone was going, uh, was given um, a motivation that I could somehow understand and respect. But in this one, it just was so flimsy. And I think this, yeah, this whole like savages idea is probably a very interesting discussion because both sides see the other ones as savages for like very different reasons. So that was interesting. But at the same time, this is just not the kind of conflict I like reading about, I guess. And yeah, for a time they were just kind of too powerful and things were just like too hopeless but then you get a little bit of hope back and then that's what keeps me going. I always need like a little bit of hope and a little bit of like momentum and things not to feel so stuck I guess. So um, yeah this was a mixed bag for me, uh, uh, up and down. Um, I think we, we see a lot of the characters die in this book, a lot of the characters that were very important in the first one, so uh, we see Kuni's death as well. I really like that scene um, because he was like cunning and very smart and up until the end and I love that he managed to make Thera, I think it is, um, into the air. I thought that was so ingenious how he did it because he hadn't really told anyone except for Luan until that point. So yeah, I think that was a very great scene and I was very happy with that. Then we also see Jin's death, which was a, a little bit heartbreaking for me because I really liked her. She was such an amazing character. And one of the things that really bothered me in this book were um, the kind of conflict between between Jia and Jin. So yeah, that was so sad, um, but still done in a way that was very fitting, I guess. Um, then we see Risana's death, which I don't know how I feel about. Like, I did not want her to die because I think she is an interesting character and she definitely did not deserve it, let's be real. Um, but I think because she was such a minor character in the second book, it doesn't feel like it will have like the biggest impact on the next book because, yeah, it just feels like she was fading away anyway and wasn't like that big of uh, an important character. She had like a couple of scenes in here, but like they were very small and even though they were great, they were just such small pieces in this very long book. We also see Moon, I think. Um, so he, that's the the butcher guy. <laughs> um, I really liked him. I really liked that scene with his partner and the baby they got. And it was just so cute. And so it was definitely heartbreaking to see his death. And yeah, overall, I feel like this book kind of ended the first era <laughs> even though we have like a lot of different eras in these books but like for the storytelling arc like a lot of those characters are dead now and so going into the third book we will now focus on the new characters and we we have the like the children of um Kuni and so I'm interested to see how that will go because now they're all in like very very different places and the three eldest children you could say are all like kings and queens and emperors and empress uh, of their own like kingdoms now <laughs> because we have oh god the names Timu is uh, now married to the like Ryuku princess girl that raped him and I did not appreciate that scene at all um, then we have Thera who went to the, what are they called? There is an A and an O and a G somewhere in there. Agon? Is that one? I don't remember. <laughs> so bad with names. But she went to these other isles for that. And now Thero, I don't know how you would say that, um, is the kind of interim emperor of Dara. So... That's interesting. And then we also have the fourth child. Up until now, we don't really know what she's doing, but I hope that we will see more of her as she grows up. So it's definitely an interesting setup. And after finishing this book, I definitely wanted to go into the third book and wanted to know 
more. <laughs> but um, I also wanted to thank the people on Yulene's um, Discord. I'm so glad I can always shout my opinions at you and that we can discuss things and it makes this reading experience so much better. And so I was told that the third book starts with a different perspective or we're like in a different part of the world for the beginning of the book. So yeah, I will take a short break, read one other book in between and then I'll go into the third book and I'll let you know once I'm halfway through. So you can probably hear from my voice that I'm sick. <laughs> um, I'm gonna keep this update short, I hope, but I'm in the middle of the whale throne now, pretty much halfway through and I wanted to give you a quick update. Um, this book I'm definitely struggling with more. It's also because I had quite a busy time, so I wasn't really able to read a lot. But also that I think um, there is a lot of build-up at the beginning of this book. Now, when we start into the book, we're basically jumping right in where we left off with the last one. And I was really excited to learn more about what was going on. But then we have another time jump of eight years. And that's where most of this first half is happening. And I found myself um, yeah, just not caring so much because a lot of the characters that we're following now are different characters from the ones we've had in the previous books. And <clears throat> even though I do care for some of them, I'm not always on board with their storylines, kind of. So it's a bit of a mixed bag for me at the moment and I don't think I will enjoy this book as much as the other two. Also, I think with um, books that are inspired by Chinese history and the adult fantasy genre, you always have to expect some kind of like Nanking-like scene and that happened in this book as well. There was a very, very horrific scene um, lots of trigger warnings. Um, it was so uncomfortable to read and it was really not fun at all. Um, so yeah, I kind of forced myself through that chapter. So just be warned that there is, yeah, I, d I don't even want to call it a torture scene because it is much more in some way, but yeah, it's, it's, truly a horrific chapter. Because stuff like this has happened in the past, you can't really say that it is just shock value, I guess, but still, um, I could have lived with it not being quite as bad as it was um, in the descriptions. So yeah, overall, I'm still enjoying this and I hope that this weekend, since I'm sick, I will have a lot of time to just sit down and read it. So I just want to go quickly into a couple of spoilers, but really not that many. So basically we're now following uh, three storylines. We're following the three children, um, mainly of Kuni, like the eldest children. Um, and we have a little bit of Gia mixed in there and the youngest child as well. But for now she doesn't play a huge role, I would say. So we see Thera now. Um, we start with her voyage, which had some like cool moments, like pirate sea battle moments in the beginning. And I did have fun with that. Nope. But I felt the resolution to that was a little bit odd. Um, and then, as I said, we have the time jump, so we see Thera in her kind of settled state, where she's trying to prepare the Agon for the fight and trying to create a world where they can learn from each other, but it's like very difficult because basically no one wants to learn from the other because they see each other as barbarians. And while I think that these are interesting um, discussions to have, like how much can you learn from others and when do you kind of start colonizing others, I think it's also an interesting like contrast case to the situation in the Northern Isles of Dara. But um, there are still quite a few um, more frustrating bits in that storyline. But I feel like this is still the one that has a nice flow and that I'm interested in. And I'm 
very intrigued to see what happens with their big plan now in the second part of the book. And then we follow uh, Timu and uh, his Liuku wife in the Northern Isles of Dara. Now this um, is a very like harrowing perspective because as I said there we can see like the colonization and Timu is trying to protect his people but failing in the long run. So yeah, and the way that this progressed right now, we just had the big scene where basically this like super supremacist Thane is um, turning around the politics so that they will kill the native people again and stuff like that, which is kind of what Gia wanted. Like you can totally see how it makes sense from this political point of view, but obviously seeing people like that is just so horrifying and the whole like waving a baby around, killing a whole village thing, it was so horrible. That chapter was just so, so horrible. And there is this moment where, I think Nazu is the name, uh, where she screams something at this Thane being like, I want you to die in a horrible way, basically. Um, and I felt that so much, and I really hope she does. Um, I usually don't hope for people to die, but that was so much. That was basically like Marjorie Taylor Greene, but if she had more brains, I guess, um, and could do actual political maneuvering. But yeah, that's that. And then we also have a little bit of the main Dara storyline where we see the struggle between whatever his name is, because he's not important right now, <laughs> the uh, second son of Kuni and Jia. And Jia is not ready to give up the reins to him yet. And she's planning something with like, I don't know, poison. Like it sounds like a chemical warfare kind of deal. Um, which is terrifying and yeah we see that the son whatever his name is I'm so sorry that he's um, into the whole like training the Garina Finn um, so that's gonna be interesting as well the way that this will progress and I think with him we can definitely see a lot of his father at the same time yeah, he's not quite his father, but I think we can see quite a lot of him in the choices he makes, especially with this one Liuku, like, ref refugee that just told him he's not gonna help him with his secret project, and he accepts that, so that was very nice to see. Um, so yeah, I'm intrigued to see how it all continues, but as I said, it feels just like a lot of setup and quite a few scenes that which is not fun to read so we'll see how I like the second half of this monstrosity. So I finished The Whale Throne and I need to update you. <laughs> I actually finished this quite a few days ago. I already finished another book after this one but I just didn't get around to, to uh, filming the update so sorry for that. Um, so my thoughts are already a little bit vague. Now, I remember when I talked about the halfway point that I wasn't loving this book at that moment, that there were a lot of like quite horrible dark things happening that I wasn't really super happy to have to read about because, you know, sometimes you just, you just don't want to. Um, and this book changed gears quite a bit after that and the second half of this book actually has this like really fun cozy theme <laughs> there is something happening that makes it so much lighter and it focuses more on beauty on teamwork on coming together to fight for something that you love and that was so lovely i definitely needed that and so this book was then elevated again to 4.5 stars for me while after reading the first half i thought it would be more of a four star book in total but yeah just with all of that was going on in the second half of the book I then liked it quite a lot again so yeah I am definitely happy that it turned out that way but I'm also a little bit worried going into the fourth book now because I feel like a lot of more horrible things are gonna happen again and um yeah 
that's like my overall thoughts really enjoyed this one again and even though there are some dark and heavy parts in it I think that overall it manages to have a little bit of balance especially with the second half and then in the author's note it is talked about how this and the last book were supposed to be one big story so I don't know what Ken you was thinking because that would have been a 2000 page book but um, yeah, I guess um, that's why we have a little bit of a wonky balance there with like all the dark parts in the first half and then the more lighter, fun, cool parts in the second one. So um, I'm gonna go into a couple of spoilers, but not too many, so this video won't be too long. But if you haven't read this one, just jump over it and you can hear my final thoughts on the final book. And so, yeah, in this one we have the cooking competition, which is kind of the main focus, while we do have some other things happening that also infuriated me so much. The cooking competition definitely brought my heart rate down a little bit again. And I thought it was so cool that we started following Farah more. So she's the fourth child of Kuni. And since she was very small compared to the others, we haven't really seen a lot of her yet. But I really love that we get her a little bit more now and we see that her passion is beauty and art and having fun in life, which I think it's so interesting how you can see like certain aspects of Kuni in his children, like Farah, the more like fun character. Sarah, the one who has all of the like long-term planning and just a very good overview of how things are going. And then we have Pyro, I never know how to say his name, um, who has more of the like adventurous battle kind of um, impulses. And then we have Timu, who, who is he even? Like he's the only one who does not resemble his father much, but being the firstborn, I guess that is his curse. So I just really like how we like see these different different kids and how um, they kind of fit together so well and it's like really heartbreaking to see them all like scattered throughout this world and just trying to do their part I guess and so yeah going back to the cooking competition I absolutely loved it I think it was so fun it was so cool it was a great introduction of these characters who I presume will play a bigger role in the last book now too um, so the Blossom gang, I really love them. And I also think Kinri is such an interesting character. I was really rooting for him to be a good one. <laughs> and now it's like kind of up in the open, I guess, um, with the way things end in this last, uh, in, in this third book. And um, yeah, we find out that he's actually the half brother of Zomi, which I did not expect. Like I was so shocked. It, I mean, it was so obvious, but I did not see it. Um, and the whole time I was like, hmm, it's so strange that they all think he is um, a Dara person because isn't he supposed to look different like don't they have like different skin tones and stuff but now it all makes sense it, all, it was so obvious <laughs> how did I not get it um, also how they talk about how his mom never said who his father was because his mom has five husbands and they were always fighting and uh, kind of thought that the one who gets her to be pregnant first would then be like the most powerful one. But it didn't work out that way because, oh my god, yeah, it was, um, it was a lot. And I was actually very shocked that I did not see it earlier. Um, but that was also such a heartfelt ending, I feel like. It was, um, yeah, emotional and I'm intrigued to see where that whole storyline goes now. And um, then we have Athera, and Athera is now with Yagon and trying to, um, I don't know, I don't know what she's even trying to do, like, she's trying to fight the Lyuku on their own shore so they can't send reinforcements. And the way that played out made me so mad so mad i'm so mad like this whole storyline thera did not deserve that like she should be happy as the empress with somi as her lover and they should like flourish but no <laughs> kelly wants me to suffer 
and I hate it. I, I literally, I was so mad. The moment we see that Takwal's uncle is the one who uh, betrayed them, I got so mad. And I really, I have no idea how this is gonna play out. Like, this is the storyline where I'm like, I have no clue what's gonna happen. I don't know. The Argon people get on my nerves so much. Like, I do like the commentary on colonialization that we get with these three people that we're now interacting with but at the same time I don't get it like uh, no I'm not getting into it I'm just I'm um, no I can't do that to my poor heart but yeah it, it's infuriating to me truly I wish we didn't have that storyline as I said I wish Sarah would be Empress with so me and they can they can figure out things now the person i don't trust is gia like gia is up to something with her weird little like gas that she's producing that makes rabbits and seemingly prisoners kill themselves she's up to something and it does sound like a uh, kind of mass destruction warfare and it's it's I don't know. Um, so I'm very worried about where that is going. Um, I'm intrigued to see more of the whole, like, Fyro, is that his name? I don't know. But his storyline with training the Garina Finns in the mountains secretly and stuff like that. And now it's probably converged, so we'll have the um, Blossom Gang with them. We'll see about that but that's something i found very intriguing so i'm very happy to now start the last book even though i read the first chapter last night and i already regretted everything again and wanted to throw the book out of the window but i'm gonna get through this my poor heart is gonna get through this and i'll let you know how it goes I'm currently halfway through Speaking Bones and since I'm planning on reading some more tonight I want to give you my quick update. So I just finished the, I don't know, one of the parts, the Thunder Awakened Forest part and I'm going into a new one now, which is pretty much halfway. Um, this book is a lot, just as the others have been. So I started with the first chapter of this and I was already ready to throw it across the room and never pick it back up again. But I am persevering because I need to know how it ends and I have a couple of things that I need to happen and I hope that they will happen and I will be happy when they do. <laughs> like... A lot is riding on the ending of this book. But yeah, um, this second, the this first half of this last book was definitely a struggle again, but in a way that it is just well written, but there is so much going on that is just infuriating. And some of these characters are just so evil or so twisted that I just hate them so much. And it's not fun to read. It's definitely not fun and it actually took me a very long time to read this because I've had some struggles going on in my private life as well and it was just too much like I could not bring myself to put this uh, to pick this book up in the evenings I just didn't want to so it's definitely not a series you should read when you want to feel good <laughs> it's one that you should read when you want to be very mad at the world and at people um, but yeah I'm, I still think it is done really, really well, even though I must say that especially during the end of the second half, I saw that 
you know, the criticism that I heard that the technical details get a little bit too much. Um, it's definitely in the first half of this book. Like, there is a big battle, and it's, like, very intense. A lot going on, a lot riding on it. And then we just get these descriptions of how some of these things were invented in the middle of the battle. And it was frustrating, to say the least. So, yeah, that, that definitely is criticism that I say is very valid. And I'm intrigued to see whether that happens again in the second half of this. But apart from that, I think it is very well crafted. And even though I really can't understand some of these characters, they still feel real in a way. And there are some moments of light. There are some moments of hope. There are moments when I just wanted to like dance and, and scream because finally something was going right for our characters. So it is not well rounded yet <laughs> because still the like infuriating bits are more but it's 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 done well it's just done well so i'm gonna go into a couple of tiny spoilers not too many um and then i will tell you what i think when i finish the book imagine that so let's get into some spoilers now we start off with Thera's journey and also her kids, which I thought was very interesting. And I love Thera. She's my favorite character in all of this. And her journey is really not easy. And I felt so much for her. Like we get to see her in so many like difficult times and the way she just struggled after losing her children. It was just so heartbreaking. But then things get turned around quite quickly. And I loved seeing that little plot that they did to finally, finally bring down Tanvanaki's brother, could you, I think? Um, I was celebrating when he was dead. It was so fantastic. But it also took um, Takwal from us, which... Um, it was sad. It was really sad. Like, I was not ready to lose him. Um... But yeah, I'm so excited because I think in the next part we will get Thera again and I definitely need to know what's happening now because we basically leave her after that. Like we learn that um, they destroyed the city ships and that's what, what we get in this first half. So I need to know what happens to her. But then we go back to Dara and we see the whole struggle and Gia is just the most infuriating character I've ever read about. Like I want to punch her so bad. She's so stuck in her way and doing things her way and she can't see anything else. Like she just is so single-minded and her idea of using these berries with some kind of like fungal poison to get rid of the Lyuku, it may work. But it's not humane, even though she thinks it is. And she doesn't trust anyone with that knowledge. And so people hate her. And then she's bitter about being hating her. Um, I, pff, I don't know. <laughs> she's so infuriating. I just can't. And then we have that whole battle scene with, again, the like, inventions part, which were just too long. Like, I love Rati, but that was just too much. <laughs> But I love the battle. I think the way that we see, see um, Gostan and uh, Fyro, whatever his name is, just come together at the end, how he saves her and how she earns respect. No, she develops respect for him. And the way that if these two people were in charge, they could probably meet halfway and they could probably make things happen. So I'm very intrigued to see where Gostan's uh, son ended up because so far he hasn't shown up again in this book and I'm pretty sure she, that he will at some point. Uh, same with Farah. Um, so yeah, we'll see about that. The battle was great, but then the whole resolution with Gia is just so infuriating. And now we're at the point where um, Fyro learned that she killed his mother. And so he's abandoning his army to get revenge, but not in a like military way. So I'm intrigued to see what happens next. Um, I guess that I think I've heard that the ending is kind of bittersweet and that it ends in a way that is fitting. So I really don't know what to expect. Like, I really want to get 
rid of Gia. I want to see, uh, what's her name, Kutan Rovo, whatever her name is. I want to see her dead so bad. Like, yeah, she needs, she needs to go. And we'll see. I'm excited to get to the end of this. It's definitely a journey. And I, I don't know if I can recommend these books, but they are very good. <laughs> so... I did it! I finished Speaking Bones by Ken Yu. So I'm here now to give you an update on the last book but also on the series as a whole. So if you are thinking about starting this um, I will give you some recommendations. But first let's talk um, quickly about the last book. Now um, this one, the second half of this unfortunately was quite a disappointment for me. There are some things that went the way that I wanted, but there were also some things that I just did not enjoy about this book. And the ending was not to my taste, unfortunately. I think this book built up too much and then the conclusion just felt too easy and too much like wishful thinking for me. And that's just something that was so sad um, because yeah, I've suffered with these characters. I really did. And I was not satisfied with the ending. So in the end, I gave this last book four stars. Um, I, d I actually now, <laughs> I don't know if I will ever reread these. Just because, yeah, it's just, if you know where it will go, I think a lot of these things are even harder to read. But we'll see about that. But yeah, talking about the whole series, I would say that I definitely recommend the first book to everyone. Grace of Kings was definitely my favorite in the series and I think it stands on its own really, really well. Because you could also say that this is even more like a prequel to the series because there we get to know um, the country of Dara, um, all of the islands and um, the kind of philosophies, the rulers, the type of rulers and stuff like that. So highly recommend that. I loved that book and you can just read that and just be happy <laughs> with the way it ends, which I definitely wanted to do because I had the feeling that continuing on with this series would make things much harder. Um, and then if you decide to read on, you have to read all of the books or you won't get any like nice conclusion, I would say, because the other three books are one big arc, one big story. And so I'm not quite sure whether I would recommend these other three books now, knowing what I know. <laughs> um, because you really have to be prepared to suffer quite a lot. And I think readers who enjoy the kind of suffering probably, like not enjoy, how do I explain that? Like who enjoy seeing horrible things happen because that's just how the world works basically. Um, I think those would also feel a little bit iffy about the ending, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and readers who would agree with the ending probably would not enjoy reading about so much horrible stuff for three books. <laughs> I don't know. That's just a feeling that I have. But yeah, overall, um, definitely 100% the first book is recommended like so much. And then you just have to figure out whether you want these characters to suffer and whether you want to see that. That's my overall thoughts on the series. So now for the last time, I'm gonna go into a couple of spoilers for the last book. So if you haven't finished the series yet, I would highly recommend leaving this video right now. Leave a like or a nice comment if you want. I would love to hear whether you now wanna pick up this series or at least the first book. And thank you for watching. So let's talk spoilers. <laughs> um, I don't really know where I left off with the last update. Um, I think we were just going back to Thera and 
Her whole storyline just infuriates me in so many ways and obviously at the end Can you tried to turn it around so she won uh, against the Lyuku but then the Agon were like you're not one of us and then this horrible uncle of Takwal um, appears again because just Bad people can't die in the series, let's be real. So he then destroys everything again for his own gain. And yeah, I just hated that. I just, I was so mad at this whole scene. And so then Thera and her people just flee. And what I also found so cheap about this is that we never see Thera finding her children. Like we suddenly get a chapter and they're all together. And then can use like, oh well, um, I will not tell you all the like sappy details about how these people reunited and how happy they were because who, who wants to read about happiness? And I'm like, I, me, that's me. I want to read about happiness. <laughs> so yeah, I really did not like that. It was like not explained at all. Um, but then they figure out how to read like the spirit portraits or whatever and then it all comes out that maybe farming isn't the devil's work and yeah i don't know i just don't know how i feel about that um i guess uh what i do agree with in that storyline is that change has to come from within like from the bottom up and that thera tried to do the change from the top down and that just didn't work obviously so that's one part I agreed with and then we have the whole like Dara storyline where obviously we see um, Chia's plot come to an end still don't know how I feel about that I think um, I think can you tried to discuss it in a yeah well-rounded fashion um, because we see um, Soto talk to Gia and then we see Kogo talk to Gia and I really liked the discussion with Kogo I think that was my favorite part about it but I don't know if I, I think Ken Yu in the end didn't know whether Gia was a villain or not and you can really see that um, that he didn't really make a judgment himself and so as a reader you're like okay so what what is it trying to tell me like is it is like doing horrible things worth it for the end or not? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know what the book was trying to say there. So I don't know how, how I feel about that, to be honest. Then obviously Fyro dies. Um, that was quite the shock for me because I did not expect it to go that way. And then the discussions we have afterwards, um, especially the discussion between Zomi and Farah, I just did not understand. Like suddenly Farah was completely a different person. Like I did not recognize her as the Farah that we've been following the whole time. And I just, again, I have no idea what Kenji was trying to say there. Like uh, it just felt to me the same way that Chia sees the world, that um, we're just born a certain way and that we can't grow and we can't learn and we, can, we can't become the kind of people we need to be for our place in the world. And that's just something that I do not ascribe to. Like, I don't like that sentiment. But it kind of felt that way because then Pharaoh was like, oh no, Pharaoh wouldn't have been a good emperor. Like, he couldn't have been a good emperor. And I'm like, why not? Like, who who can decide that? Like, so many people in this last part of the book are like, oh, you can't see the future, you can't see the future. But then we can be like, yeah, but Farah wouldn't have been good. Like, why? <laughs> I do not understand. And then with Farah, she never even thought she would be Empress. And just because of the way she is, she does a good job. Why? I don't understand. So yeah, I felt like this whole message at the end that we are just born a certain way, I hated that. Like I really hated that and I think that's why I feel so unsatisfied with the ending. But then again, 
we have this whole like last bit with the kind of peace and um, not punishing the Lyuku too much and in, uh, integrating them into Dava society. Where I'm like, how? <laughs> how would you do that? You know, like they did such horrible things. And I don't know, I don't know. I felt like it was so easy to just be like, okay, now we jump like 30 years into the future and it worked out. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know, like I felt like there was a book missing where we actually look at the situation and see how can people find peace again after something like that. And we just didn't get that. And I feel like, we could have scratched a lot of the atrocities that we had to see and just focus more on that part because that's also humanity. Like healing is also part of humanity, but I feel like we did not see that in the series at all. We were just told, and now we all heal and then it's done. And it just it was so unsatisfying to me. Um, and then obviously at the very end, we get the reunion of Thera and Somi, and that actually made me cry. <laughs> it was so beautiful. It was something that I wanted for so long. And so I was glad that I did get that at the end, but it just couldn't save the book anymore because yeah, I was just too disappointed at that point. Um, so I was crying, I was happy for them, but all of the other things just felt too flat for a series that was so detailed and so well thought out. It just, it didn't work for me. So that's my final thoughts. <laughs> I would love to hear what you thought. Um, and yeah, maybe that is also like my German perspective. I talked about this on one of the discords. Um, special thanks to Parumita, who was always there to <laughs> just um, let me know that my feelings are valid and stuff like that. Um, it was great to have someone to talk to. Um, but yeah, I think as a German who obviously, like my great, great grandparents were probably Nazis. And so, you know, seeing over the generations how we deal with that, how we deal with the guilt and how we deal with hope and how some things will just reappear, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's, that's just also kind of what influences my perspective on the ending of this book. Because I felt like a lot of the atrocities that we see in the series are very similar to the things that were done by the Nazis. And so maybe that's also why. Maybe if you come from a different country, you will read this book completely differently and be satisfied with the ending. That could very well be. And I would love to hear about that as well. So thank you so much for watching. This is probably a very, very long video. I'm sorry for that. But if you watch it till the end, I hope you had fun and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.